Hello. Well, I, um, I am Jennifer Chase. I am the Dean of the School of Information. Welcome to the winter commencement for the Masters of Information and Data Science, MIDS, and Master of Information and Cybersecurity, Mike's programs at UC Berkeley School of Information. This, yes. This is literally my first day on the job as dean of the iSchool. Really? <laughs> I just arrived in, uh, in Berkeley uh, in the wee hours of Sunday morning, so it's really my, my first day on the job. Uh, the only thing that was hanging in my rental closet was this. Okay, seriously, I shipped it out to make sure it would be here if my luggage got lost. My luggage did arrive, though. Okay, but now, seriously, I can't imagine a more wonderful way to start my time at Berkeley than to have the honor to preside over this commencement. I thank you for that, really. Okay, I first want to welcome the 80 graduates who are here today in person. Let us all welcome them. We are here to celebrate their completion of the MIDS and MIKES degrees. This is an impressive accomplishment not only because they have completed the rigorous and demanding curriculum, but also because the majority of these graduates have done so while working full or part-time. Today we are celebrating the 87 other, we are also celebrating the 87 other classmates who completed their degrees in the summer or fall of 2019, but are unable to join us today. This gives us a total of 167 new graduates between the MIDS and MIKES program from both the summer and fall 2019 terms. Again, congratulations. I also want to welcome the iSchool faculty and staff who are here today to celebrate this accomplishment. They provide the substance and support structure for this outstanding educational experience. Last but not least, and I'm getting some help on this, I would like to welcome the family and friends of the graduates who have come here from all over the country and the world to celebrate these graduates. Sorry. I especially want to thank the families parents, spouses, children, and friends of today's graduates for supporting them throughout the MIDS and Mike's journey. As some of you know, today we are celebrating the inaugural graduating class of the Mike's program. We started this program just a little over a year ago and have watched the first class grow and accomplish so much together as a group. We want to highlight their extraordinary accomplishments over the past year and a half. They certainly, they have certainly set the bar high for future Mike's graduating classes. As we enter, as we enter the seventh year of the MIDS program, we are pleased to note with today's group of graduates, there are now over 600 MIDS alumni. Our MIDS graduates here today will be joining a dynamic international network of data scientists who are a source of career advice and support, friendship, and lifelong colleagues. These 600 alumni work in a wide range of industries and companies. The tech industry remains popular with graduates working at the usual suspects, Amazon, Apple, Facebook, Google, IBM, Intel, and Microsoft, as well as Disney, DoorDash, Pinterest, Spotify, and Uber. 
Several graduates are working in finance and banking at companies like J.P. Morgan Chase, Wells Fargo, Two Sigma, and Citadel. Others can be found working in health care at Blue Shield of California, Kaiser Permanente, and UCSF. And others are working in consulting at Accenture, PwC, and McKinsey. I want to acknowledge the hard work and commitment that all of the students have put forth throughout their time in the program. We know that juggling work in school is not easy. For example, at least two of the graduates today have added a new baby during their time in the program, with one being born during their capstone course in their final term of the program. Okay, yes, that was a hard lift, obviously. Uh, a number of students have also gotten married and have likely delayed their honeymoon while in the program. Again, the ability of our students to balance and manage all of these life challenges alongside classes shows how incredibly committed and talented they are. At the same time, many of our graduates today are also completing their second go-around at Cal. With, on, with the online format of the MIDS and Mike's degrees giving these students the opportunity to complete their second master's degree at UC Berkeley. These previous degrees include an MBA at Haas, a master's in material science, and many others. Go Bears. Now I'd like to introduce our commencement speaker, Alice, Alex Stamos. Alex is a cybersecurity expert, business leader, and entrepreneur working to improve the security and safety of the internet through teaching and research. Stamos is an adjunct professor at Stanford's Freeman Spogli Institute and a visiting scholar at the Hoover Institution. Prior to joining Stanford, Alex had served as the chief security officer of Facebook, where he represented Facebook and Silicon Valley to regulators, lawmakers, and civil society on six continents. He has served as a bridge between the interests of internet policy, of the internet policy community, and the complicated reality of platforms operating at billion user scale. He is the co-author of Information Operations and Facebook, a highly cited examination of the influence campaign against the US election, which still stands as the most thorough description of the issue by a major technology company. Before joining Facebook, Alex was Chief Information Security Officer at Yahoo. In 2004, Alex co-founded ISEC Partners, an elite security consultancy known for groundbreaking work in secure software development, embedded, and mobile security. Throughout his career, Alex has worked towards making security a more representative field and has highlighted the work of diverse technologists as an organizer of the Trustworthy Technology Conference and ARSA. Alex has been involved with securing the US election system as a contributor to Harvard's Defending Digital Democracy Project and involved in the academic community as an advisor to Stanford's Cybersecurity Policy Program and UC Berkeley Center for Long-Term Cybersecurity. He lives in the Bay Area with his wife and three children. Please join me in welcoming Alex Stamos. He wants us to read the whole thing. <laughs> Sorry, you're, you're not supposed to actually read the whole bio. It's, it's against the rules. Uh, No, 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 it's good. Thank you. No, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Dean. Um, greetings, graduates, family, faculty, and distinguished guests. 
This is what I want to share. It doesn't matter how far you may rise. At some point, you are bound to stumble because if you're constantly doing what we do, raising the bar, if you're constantly pushing yourself higher, higher the law of averages, not to mention the myth of Icarus, predicts that you will at some point fall. And when you do, I want you to know this, remember this, there is no such thing as failure. Failure is just life trying to move us in another direction. And the key to life is to develop an internal, moral, emotional GPS that can tell you which way to go. Because now and forever, more, when you Google yourself, you will see the words Harvard 2013. So if that heart opening paragraph seemed a little generic and perhaps targeted to the wrong graduating class, it, it's because I didn't write it, you caught me. Um, this is my first commencement speech and uh, my nervousness here today gave me a little bit of writer's block. Uh, you guys have done a lot to make this day happen um, and I've been given, perhaps mistakenly, uh, the ability to retroactively ruin your memory of all that work, uh, as well as to embarrass you uh, in front of your family members and friends. So I did what any self-respecting techie would do in this situation. I threw machine learning at the problem. Um, so while on the flight home from New York yesterday, I trained OpenAI's GPT-2 uh, text uh, uh, machine learning uh, neural network on the celebrated graduation speeches of Oprah Winfrey, Steve Jobs, and David Foster Wallace. And so I let the AI write my opening paragraph. Uh, what you heard was actually my second attempt. Uh, the first time I tried training the model on the top 10 graduation speeches of all time as chosen by Time Magazine. Um, but unfortunately, the inclusion of Winston Churchill and General George Marshall uh, meant that the output had some unnecessary and unsettling references to the German menace. Um, so I, I retrained it with uh, a more contemporary graduation speeches. Um, but even then, I'm pretty sure that was not gonna be bearable for the 15 minutes of commencing I'm expected to do up here. Um, so I, I'll be on the, my own for the way out. Uh, and to start us off, I, I wanna start with some career advice uh, for the newly minted graduates of the School of Information. Cybersecurity and online safety are fantastic fields to get into. And they're fantastic because they're the only areas of computer science and engineering that actually get worse every year. <laughs> and every other way, computing technology has gone pretty damn amazing. Every adult in this room is carrying around a pocket supercomputer with more compute power than all of NASA had when they put a man on the moon, more storage than the equivalent of a, the printed holdings of a university library, and a constant connection to billions of other pocket super, supercomputers, as well as much of the collective sum of human knowledge. Not a single aspect of our lives has not been touched by the unstoppable progression of computers getting more powerful, smaller, and cheaper. So then why does security and safety get worse every year? Well, it turns out that the advances that makes computing more powerful also make it more, co more complicated and more fragile. The same abstractions and high-level languages that allow a much larger set of software engineers to be productive also allow them to operate with very little understanding of how these systems actually work many layers down. Most importantly, the incredible decrease in the cost of compute have led companies to, that, to push technology into every nook and cranny of modern life. And when you insert technology into the messiness of human existence, you end up creating the possibility that small technical mistakes will be amplified into suffering and tragedy. This is why you graduates are going to spend your careers dealing with a whole new set of dystopian realities that were not on the radar of anybody in my graduating East class from 19 years ago. Even those of us who were really interested in security at the time weren't considering the possibility that we'd be, end up being collectively responsible for malware vulnerable light bulbs or people losing their entire life savings due to email compromise. We certainly didn't see the idea of tech being involved in teenage bullying or the online fomenting of ethnic violence. Our generation of technologists were not ready for these possibilities and I'm really sorry to say that we've left all of you with a bit of a mess to clean up. One of the other reasons security and safety are getting worse is that in contrast to other fields of engineering, there are people who are paid to spend their day making it worse. We often call these adversaries. Adversaries is a great word. It's the word cybersecurity professionals like to use for humans, perhaps sitting at keyboards thousands of miles away, who are trying to break into the systems and the software we build. The word is not inaccurate, although it's sometimes deployed unnecessarily and performatively. In those situations, you can hear the implied italics in the word, as if the speaker is deriving it from the Latin root, live, right in front of you. Adversaries. It's bloodless, professional, neutral, and that it can be used from a teenager in a basement to a signals intelligence officer drinking government coffee. 
using adversaries identifies the speaker as part of the cybersecurity initiated. And most importantly, sounds a lot better for the accurate term, which is bad guys. I actually use the term adversaries every day. But we need to be very careful to not let our adversaries distract us from our enemies. These words are not synonyms. Our adversaries are people. People who come and go depending on our job, their job, what's happening in the world to drive certain conflicts, and what products we've shipped. Our enemies, on the other hand, are the things that hold us back from doing better. And the real enemies in the technology world are arrogance, complacency, and a lack of empathy for those who we are supposed to protect. And if you give me a moment, I'd like to explain to you your enemies to you so that maybe you can defeat them in a way that our generation was not able to. I think the arrogance of the tech industry is pretty self-evident. It is arrogant to believe that our skills at building devices that are fundamentally just really fast versions of the graphing calculators our parents were forced to buy, and our ability to talk to those super powerful graphing calculators and funny graphing calculator language, that those skills make us qualify to destroy and rebuild, excuse me, I mean disrupt, uh, every facet of human society. It is arrogance that has led us to applying the minimally viable product strategy of shipping products that transform areas of human endeavor informed by hundreds of years of philosophical debate. It is arrogance that causes us to use the term artificial intelligence to describe brute force statistical methods that, as you heard from my opening paragraph, are barely capable of performing a half-assed job with failure modes that we can't even understand. That's arrogance. Complacency is the acceptance of a status quo that, if properly re-examined to fresh eyes, would lead any ethical software engineer to instead retire to the mountains to build children's furniture out of fallen redwoods instead of running a compiler ever again. You see this complacency everywhere you look in the modern world of tech. Every time you put a username and password into a website that does something critical, you are experiencing the collective complacency of the entire technology world. The username and password paradigm is a relic of the 1970s. From timeshare architectures, when universities and corporations need to keep track of which department to charge for CPU time or punch card blinks, it is not a model of authentication that makes any sense in a world where you're using a pocket supercomputer to connect to the computers that control your retirement accounts or your sensitive financial records. At my previous employer, we caught over 500,000 accounts being taken over every single day because the user had reused the password in multiple places and one of them had been compromised. This is just what one company caught on its own. And each one of those integers is actually a person whose entire electronic life could be stolen and turned upside down. Yet due to collective momentum, our industry is still asking people to memorize hundreds of random strings and to keep them in their head if they want to participate in modern society safely. And that brings us to the lack of empathy. Empathy is the ability to put yourself in somebody else's shoes and to feel what they are feeling. As one of my favorite authors, Neil Gaiman, once said, and I'm talking about the real man this time, this isn't AI generated. Empathy is a tool for building people into groups, for allowing us to function as more than self-obsessed individuals. Now, despite what you might read in the papers, I don't think that technologists are uniquely unempathetic to others. Many of my colleagues have demonstrated themselves to have empathy and understanding for those who live very different lives. But the challenge for all people is having the same understanding and empathy for those who are in front of us, for those who live very different lives in very different circumstances. This is a universal shortcoming. It's something you see all the time in the way that we treat tragedies that happen close in our hometown versus those that happen in a foreign land. It's something that we should all try, strive to improve about ourselves. But in the case of technologists, like all of you graduates, the challenge of understanding the plights of others can make us much worse at our jobs. And we're not the first people in history who have been asked to apply our specialized skills to improve the lives of others. Engineers, scientists, doctors, many other professions have demonstrated responsibility to others, whether it is to build a trustworthy bridge, deliver safe drinking water, cure disease. But these professions all often have the benefit of direct relationships with those who they're serving, or at least being part of the culture where the people live that most of the, who will most get their benefit. That can make having empathy for those people relatively easy. And it's much harder when you're building something that millions of billions of people might use, especially when those are strangers who speak hundreds of languages, come from a multitude of cultural backgrounds, and are interacting with modern technology in a way that seems completely alien to somebody who is able to get, say, a master's in information from the world's greatest university. Technologists almost always end up building technologies for ourselves, or at a maximum, for the people who we know immediately, like members of our family. I've heard many of my colleagues say, we should make this so easy that our parents can use it. 
Now, our parents, many of whom are here today, are not at all reflective of the diversity of people in society who need our help. And even if we were trying to build stuff for our parents, we're pretty obviously failing, which is proven to the fact that every single graduate here has had their summers and Thanksgivings ruined by the need to fix the Wi-Fi or to get the malware off of their parents' computers. We are failing in having empathy for the people that we need to help. And so what can you do about that? What can you do about these enemies? The enemies of arrogance, complacency, and lack of empathy. These are the enemies that could rob you of the only thing that really matters in your career. The ability to look back and to say, honestly, that your time was spent helping others. The only advice I can give you here is to try to be aware. To be aware of just yourself and the culture within which you work. Corporate culture is the invisible intellectual air that we breathe and that nourishes us and feeds us and makes our work possible. It can also infect us and it can help us rationalize decisions that we never would have made on our own. Now, I don't claim any special ability to resist culture at this point. Um, I have certainly been part of decisions that I look back upon with regret. And it's seductive to go along with the expectations of your boss, your colleagues, your shareholders, but you have to resist that. It can also be seductive to put yourself on a path where you might never be faced with hard decisions, where you can be free to always criticize without taking any ethical risks yourself. I regret sometimes when I could have spoken up, I regret times when I could have been more forceful. I imagine alternative scenarios where I could have been more effective in fixing things or making things better. But what I don't regret is putting myself in the room where the decisions are being made. I like to try to resist the nihilism that comes from looking back and finding situations where you see yourself fail. Changing a company, an industry, a government, a society, it is very hard to do that from the inside. And deciding to get on a massive ship when you have a tiny oar in your hand and telling yourself, hmm, maybe I can help this ship avoid that iceberg, that is terrifying. And so doing so is not a choice that I can either recommend or make for you. But if you do make that choice, then I recommend that you have the self-knowledge to understand why you and your colleagues are failing and have the courage to confront people who you otherwise like and respect to help them figure out a way that you can vanquish those collective enemies. So let me close by wishing you the greatest success in your careers. Success not measured by financial reward or public accolades, but in knowing your, yourself and feeling confident that your efforts have made the world a slightly better place. Or, as my good friend, a statistical model built from the words of better graduation speakers running on a graphic card, once said, in closing, I want to tell you that I consider today, as I sat on the stage this morning getting teary for you all, and then teary for myself, I consider today a defining milestone in a very long and blessed journey. The Oprah Winfrey Show was number one in our time slot for 21 years, and I have to tell you, I'm pretty comfortable with that level of success. Thank you, congratulations, and go Bears. Okay, so uh, I would now, um, like to introduce the MIDS and Mike's student speakers. First, the Mike's student speaker, Darren Childers. I didn't practice this with this thing in my face. <laughs> I'm really. My, my audience is right here. Um, in truth, preparing to give this speech, I looked back over our course, and one of the first things I did was rewatch our very first lecture. Um, in doing so, I, I saw our self-introductions, our histories, and the reasons we came. Strangely, those are all things I'm gonna hear again tomorrow during a meet and greet with the newest cohort. During the program, we've spent countless virtual and physical hours together working on projects, lifting each other up, teaching what we know and learning from each other. Looking back through the lens of our shared experience, a theme came sharply into focus. It's not the theme I would have chosen, but when we look at the field of cybersecurity, when we look at the people we've shared this experience with as classmates, the faculty and staff, the families who've struggled behind us, we see persistent, meaningful, sacrificial acts of service. 
since the very first lecture, the now chief architect for the city of Los Angeles, has beat the drum with one truth, and Terry, you're right. It is too hard. Not completing the program, though it was certainly challenging enough to make each of us question our ability at some point. Not developing a curriculum, defining a master's in cybersecurity, though I'm sure they had similar moments of doubt and frustration. Not securing a system against most knowns, known unknowns, and unknown unknowns. Phrases that just kept coming up as we went through the program. Not securing a system in design or teaching small medical offices how to protect their data and achieve some level of HIPAA compliance. Not helping a small NGO here and around the world learn how to protect themselves. Not how to protect an intentionally poisoned Department of Energy system against themselves. <laughs> Those things are hard, but they're not too hard. The only thing that's too hard is doing any of those things alone. By choosing this path and pursuing cybersecurity, we've chosen a hard problem, but we've shown we know the solution over and over again by serving each other. Like you, I started this program because I wanted to increase my personal value in the field. I wanted to expand my knowledge in the areas of the work I've been doing for 20 years. I don't know if I've achieved that yet, but I know that I've learned a lot from each of you. From that very first lecture when Heather, Carell, Terry, and Josh put the rest of us on notice by meeting twice before the first class. <laughs> I knew that the things I'd learned through the courses would challenge me, but that the real growth would come from you. In that first lecture, I learned that there's a notional distrust of government and power, and then there's JM. <laughs> What I thought was a task-based focus on government control because we were asked to address Russia's, ask, Russia's use of cyber actually had nothing to do with the assignment whatsoever and that I would continue to learn and sharpen my perceptions about government, privacy, and true cybersecurity at the nation state and corporate feudal state through JM in every lecture on any topic. <laughs> in truth, we face threats from other individuals, corporations and governments alike, and we bear the responsibility of fighting for freedom in vast new ways in the frontier of technology. We face the need to fix policies that change far slower than technology, and we must overcome this by engaging in the policy space and working to inform laws and policy makers that their devices and the devices of their children provide utility and pose a threat. We face critical infrastructure weaknesses within systems built before cybersecurity in the interconnected world, now connected and lying vulnerable to attack. We face big medical burdens, big budgets spent on new technology, where even the IT staff make bad decisions. Heather, your name was left out to protect the innocent. And that was just the first lecture. In the very next course, we were challenged with math that made no sense. <laughs> Using material that meant I had to disclose to my security officer, and finding out that Alice and Bob have a friend who is perpetually up to no good. <laughs> but seriously, as much as we wanted, as much as we learned about the breadth of cyber from the beyond the code, we learned about the depth of the problem in doing cryptography well. Well, that and not to trust NSA primes. As we advanced through the program, we did so many things together, but just a couple of examples. In the Cyber Force competition right up the hill at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, we face head on the challenges of securing a bad industrial control system implementation. In Citizen Clinic, we helped an NGO learn some of the very basics of privacy and security and when they intersect with hostile nation state actors. Many of us met at DEF CON twice to inspire each other to hone our technical skills and to learn from drunk hacker history. With every course we faced and every shared experience, I saw over and over not the need for more people like me, or for me to become better by myself, but for us to continue to grow together to accomplish great things. While I, can't fight my, while I can fight my way through the math, I want Aaron and Matt there to make me feel stupid about it. I want Terry behind me waving his arms and forcing me to go to meetings. I want more time getting inspired by Carell and his unceasing passion. We probably need Ken's quad charts. We need Heather in the boardroom 
making sure that they make better cyber investment. We need Josh, who will keep pushing no matter who or what is in the way. We need Cameron working to break stuff while Zach works to fix it. <laughs> we need Serena's drive to keep it simple for the little guy. We need Steve working right here on campus to make Berkeley better. We need Eric to eventually quit going to school. <laughs> we need to continue to grow and learn from JM's unwavering commitment to freedom and the effects of technology on those freedoms. We need so much more from each of us. At some point during one of the hundreds of times I met with Lisa through issues or concerns brought by the cohort, she told me and it stuck with me that some people need the title in order to do the work while others just do it. I guess I must have been one of the people that needed the title. But it was an honor to serve you guys during the program. I cherish that opportunity, even as you all helped me and each other every day. In 20 months, we haven't solved the technical problems facing cybersecurity. But we have learned, or at least been further convinced, that in a field so broad, in the face of a chasm so deep, we need each other, across all disciplines, to influence the behavior of one programmer, to secure the data of one patient, to influence the policy of one government, to hide the identity of one user, or to overcome the next threat, the one after that, or the one after that. We learned that we serve each other in a fight that never ends, and that to and that it is too hard to do alone. Thanks. Thank you, Darren. It's awesome. Okay, and now I would like to introduce the mid-student speaker, Spiros Gar Garafalos, Spiros Garafalos, sorry. <laughs> Dear Dean, school faculty, fellow graduates, and guests, it is a great honor for me to stand here in front of you today representing the UC Berkeley Master of Information and in Data Science graduates for 2019. Before anything else, I'd like to congratulate all of, you, all of us for this achievement. And I'd like to thank our friends and family for their support and for putting up with us all this time. For our guests in the audience that don't know how this program works, we spend about two years talking to each other through an online video streaming app and for some of us, this is the first time we meet in person. And it's a great pleasure to confer one more time that we don't live in a simulation experiment. <laughs> my name is Spiros Garifalos, and I wanted to share with you my experience and the lessons I learned through the program. I come from sunny, warm Athens, Greece, where I was born and spent my first 35 years. A couple of years ago, I decided to relocate to the US, and by doing that, I realized that there are not very few, there are very few things that you can bring with you in this journey. In fact, there is a single thing that is guaranteed, yourself. It was then obvious to me that the only meaningful investment in life is in ourselves. I drew inspiration from Solon, one of the seven sages of the Greek antiquity. He said, Girasco ai didascomenos, which is a motivation to keep learning new things as you grow older. After some thoughts, I decided to invest all of my spare time, effort, and money in me. So I enrolled the MITS program. But why data science, you may ask? My background is in electric and computer engineering. And one day, I read a quote from Andrew Inc that AI is the new electricity. I immediately felt obsolete. I remember some of us initially were somewhat skeptical about the actual value of this program. We were afraid that the program might not be rigorous enough, that we might lose our time. Far from it. By the second term, we all started dreaming of the moment of our graduation. It is clear to us today that data science is not only about technology. 
It is a cross-section in many scientific, of many scientific fields like ethics, law, social, behavioral, and neuroscience. I would like to dare, I would dare to compare data science to what philosophy originally was, the study of the fundamental nature of knowledge, reality, and existence, to seek the truth. Another lesson I learned is that all complex systems, including the human brain, carry multiple design optimizations. It is called reducing false negatives. We are all designed to very quickly detect threatening situations, like, for example, a lurking predator, but with a cost of having some false alarms. Bias is systemic and is not limited to humans, but through us, data scientists, propagates to anything we touch. As an engineer and a scientist, this was a radical realization. To build something good, you need to have the right culture. Which brings me to my closing thoughts. We are all lucky to live in a time with open access to knowledge and information. In fact, most of the study material the program uses is either public or very easy to get. And I'm sure many other schools teach the same or very similar material. But then again, everybody will admit that UC Berkeley is one of the best schools in the world. Have you ever wondered why? I think I know. It is the culture. Throughout this ceremony, you'll notice a tenacious focus to things like diversity, freedom, respect, ethos, and moral values. And the reason is that this is the only way you can reduce bias. I believe the biggest value we've got from the program is that we were infused the school's culture through its tradition and history, the dean and the leadership team, the school faculty, our professors, all the way to us, the students and the graduates. I want to thank you all for this great gift which I plan to cherish and donate to others. As Alexander the Great said, I am indebted to my father for living, but to my teacher for living well. Thank you. Thank you, Spiros. Okay, now it is my honor to, to, to announce the Mike's Faculty Award winner, Daniel Ronke. Yay. For Cyber W23 Privacy Engineering. He's the course developer and instructor. And here is a student quote on Daniel. Daniel seemingly worked harder than any other professor. That's, I, I guess it hit to all the rest of you. <laughs> to adjust the first course on the fly. He went above and beyond to accommodate his students with multiple office hours weekly and offering additional one-on-one one -on -one meetings. He truly cares about his students and encourages them to push themselves beyond their comfort zone. Okay, uh, let's see, do I give out this award? I do, wonderful. And next, I'm going to announce the MIDS Faculty Award winner for the summer of 2019 and the fall of 2019, Kyle Hamilton, a lecturer for Data Science W261 Machine Learning at Scale. Data Science W261 is one of the most popular advanced courses in the MIDS program. And Kyle has been part of the teaching team for that course since 2017. Furthermore, Kyle played an instrumental part in the most recent redevelopment of the class. In addition to her expertise and her instructional capabilities, Kyle consistently demonstrates excellence in her dedication and care towards the continual improvement of machine learning at scale. 
and to the learning experiences of her students. Unfortunately, Kyle is in Europe and not able to join us today, but she has provided a few words. Words cannot express adequately or enough how much I appreciate the acknowledgement this award brings and the value that I place on it in light of the fact that it comes from the students themselves. Not only am I humbled by your generosity, but I am also so much the better off for having had the opportunity to teach and learn from you. Thank you. Okay. Next, I am gonna introduce Professor Chris Hufnagel, who will announce the Mike's Capstone Award. Every student in the Mike's program completes a capstone project, a summation of their work in the degree program. And we issue um, the Lily L. Chen Award for the project that ha uh, for its overall excellence. And the winners this year are Darren Childers and Serena Villalobos. Come on up. Thank you. Their project, HIPAA for All, and HIPAA stands for Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act, um, helps small offices achieve targeted security that addresses compliance and the normative issues underlying healthcare privacy. I'm gonna invite my colleague, uh, Professor Alex Hughes, to announce the uh, winner of the, of the MIDS Award. As Chris noted, in the final year of their degree, MIDS students also complete a capstone project. Um, in the course of three months or thereabouts, they go from project concept all the way through to project completion or um, maybe a, a minimum viable product that might or might not fail moving forward. <laughs> With the Halvarian Award, we're recognizing teams of graduates that most embody the School of Information's approach to data science. I wanna run down a few of the projects that did not win. Uh, we'll, we'll save the winners for a moment, but to highlight the great work that our students are doing. Just this year, students have taught computers to recognize American Sign Language, and then have coached learners in how to produce more accurate signs to be more communicative to people. Uh, teams have built models that can assess wildfire risk in real time in the current dry climate that we're existing in California. Students have built ways to automatically rate the scenery along a route so that you can take not just the fastest, but maybe you can take the most beautiful route to get from one place to another. Students have helped people to be more in touch with their emotions through heart rate monitoring and through writing exercises. Um, we'd like to recognize two projects, one from the summer term and one from the fall term, uh, for embodying the completeness, creativity, um, and, and finishing all the way through. From the summer term, we'd like to recognize uh, Snout. Anybody from the team here today? Come on up. <laughs> While they're coming up, I'll, I'll explain the work that they did. Snout helps to find people who are out mushroom hunting, literally searching for edible mushrooms, find, identify, and share what they've found. Uh, they overcame technical challenges that included uh, building models on training sets more than just grocery store mushrooms. Uh, they had to then uh, deploy these out onto phones that were going to potentially not have Wi-Fi. And they did it the entire way through with a whimsy and a care showing that, yes, we have a deep and unabiding commitment to the public good, but that we can also have fun at the same time. This is a really great project. Thank you. Don't go anywhere. Wait, 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 wait. Don't go anywhere. Darren and Serena, you have uh, plaques here too. Dude. 
Where'd you go, Dan? Dan, I've got one point something. Don't worry. Thank you. Let's take a picture. I'll grab it in a second. No worries. Okay. Thank you. Now to announce the winner for the fall 2019 term. Fall 2019 winner was Fair Air, a project by, anybody here? Come on, come on. <laughs> well, they're on the way up, I'll explain the work that they did. Despite the beautiful day that we have outside, sun in our eyes as we're taking graduation pictures, right? It's not a surprise to anybody that we're experiencing rapid human-generated climate change here. Uh, the experiences that we're seeing in Berkeley have meant more frequent fires, pollution levels that are previously unprecedented, and at the same time, the current administration is choosing to weaken federal clean air standards. Fair Air combines data from a large number of public and open source data streams to produce a comprehensive picture of outdoor air pollution. It then recommends where new sensors might optimally be placed in order to fill in the public understanding of airborne pollution. Fair Air's technical contributions included amassing and processing large amounts of real-time and streaming data, building models that make sensible location-based predictions. But the project also demonstrated a keen ability to identify how data science might be useful to help ameliorate a publicly-faced threat. Great work. Great work. Thank you. Let me bring Jennifer Chase back. Oh, you're not done? I think I'm done. You're done. Good. Just leave my stuff, please. <laughs> okay. Let's see. Where are we now? Um, so. Let's see, so that was handed off to, I'm sorry, I'm new at this. So, very, very new at this. And you're all really nice to bear with me. <laughs> okay, um, so we got the Capstone Awards, and now, uh, okay, we got the mushrooms, we got the air pollution, and now we, you did take mine. <laughs> okay. I'm going to remember that. Okay, there are other forms of security besides cybersecurity. Okay, and now we are going to do what all of you are here for, which is to confer the degrees on our new graduates. So uh, I'm going to go over there where the degrees are, and you guys are going to come up and meet me there in the order in which it was specified to you to do so. Follow the specifications. <laughs> Just a second. Dean Chase, allow me to reflect on this moment for just a second. <laughs> Stand with me here. D just a few years ago, Deans Anno Saxinian, Jesse Goldhammer, and professors Doug Tigar and Steve Weber spent many months conceptualizing and then evangelizing the idea of a Master's of Information and Cybersecurity program among our colleagues here at Cal. All of that work has paid off today as we present this inaugural cohort. I had the pleasure of getting to teach this cohort, along with Professor Tigar, and it's been a highlight of my career. Our first cohort is fantastically well qualified. We have company founders, employees, and former employees of the largest technology uh, platforms, authors of several important Lonely Planet books, and a significant number who were either active or former service members over the past um, Year and a half, these students have balanced home life, careers, and the demands of this program. And we had fun too. We met in Las Vegas for the DEF CON conference. 
Um, the students participated in hackathons, and yes, some of us relearned math. Um, I am confident these graduates will go on to do consequential work in cybersecurity. So please, Corel. So our first graduate here in this program is Corel Ballone. Thanks so much. Thank you. See you. Oh, get on. <laughs> but you, you got to go do the um. <laughs> Serena Villalobos. Stephen Rice. Darren Childers. Terrence Davis. <laughs> Heather McPherson. <laughs> Josh Hakala. <laughs> Eric Pasco. J.M. Porup. <laughs> Zach Childers. <laughs> Cameron Clifford. <laughs> Matthew Darnell Holmes. And with that, Dean Chase, I present to you our inaugural candidates for the School of Information's Master in Information and Cybersecurity. <laughs> Let me invite my colleague, Professor Hughes, who will read the names for the MIDS program. It is my great pleasure to be able to introduce the candidates for graduation from the MIDS degree program for the summer and fall terms 2019. Josiah McDonald. Shiraz Chakaverti. Chen Ying Chen and Zach. <laughs> Jen Derose. Arnobio Morlix. <laughs> J. Il Lee. Ryan Brady. <laughs> Luis Armando Villarreal.
Yuen Wang. Silas Satterley Everett. Aaron Yuan. Jay Zuniga. Scott George. Samid Musfi. Ji Zheng. Spiros Garafalnos. Unchaman Pa. Ritika Banakar. <laughs> Eric Hobbs. Christian Millsop. <laughs> Gurdit Chahal. <laughs> Sergio Ferro. Emmy Ching Yu Lao. Danielle Salal Foster. Renzi Janem Reyes. Cheat Young and Jory. <laughs> Giant Srivasa. <laughs> Taco Hisada. Pragnesh Christian Ramachadaran Vidyaskar. <laughs> she gone.
Kathleen Yeqing Wang. Ryan M. Delgado. Lalit Verma. Chandan Gope. Ravi Apian. <laughs> CG Yu. Cassandra Seni. Essen Kamar. Lance Leo Miles. Shuba Paravatsu. Hawina <laughs> Bulcha. <laughs> Faria Barkat Mardani. Arunima Kayath. Walter Burge. Abhishek Arva. <laughs> Natalia Spell. <laughs> Rahul Kailesh Varswani. Peter Trentwalder. <laughs> Debishish Mukapadai. Caitlin Swinnerton. Ian Bettinger.
Ellie Liu. David He. Daniel Olmstead. Michael Winton. Divya Gorlanta. <laughs> Ella Hale. <laughs> Kristen Thompson. Armand Koch. Vishal Argval. Dan Rasband. Usha Chala. <laughs> Suda Varma Vadakumakur. <laughs> Luis, are you still here? Luis Villarreal, are you still here? Come on back up. Come on back up. Luis is being awarded the Outstanding TA Award. Surprise. <laughs> Dean Chase, these are the candidates for graduation from the MIDS program. Okay, that was probably my mistake. Let's see. So now, uh, I want to congratulate all of you for the amazing work you've done and wish you the best of luck and let you know how much confidence and pride we have in you as you go out into the world and do wonderful things. I'd like to thank the iSchool staff for all of their hard work and for once again doing such an amazing job with graduation. And now I would like all of the graduates to rise and receive a final round of applause from the audience. And now, new graduates and family and friends, please join us outside for a reception.